Program Leader for Great Plains Fire Science Exchange, and I'll be moderating this webinar. And just a quick note, I don't want to take much time from Dr. Polly. Um, we are dedicated to making fire science accessible within the Great Plains region, and our focus is on grassland systems of the Great Plains. And um, if you're not familiar with Great Plains Fire Science, I'd like to encourage you to visit our website, and the address is there on the screen. And you, there you can sign up for our online newsletter. Um, you can access our Facebook page, the blog, uh, our videos on YouTube, and a whole host of other things that we've been working on. Uh, some of you might be interested in continuing education credits from the Society for Range Management or Society of American Foresters, and those are available for this webinar. And uh, I, uh, I can offer those to you if you send me an email after the presentation to gpfirescience at missouristate.edu. So gpfirescience at missouristate.edu if you need continuing education credits. And I'll try to remember to mention that at the end as well. And if you're not familiar with the webinar environment, let me just try to orient you to that real quickly. Um, all the participants will be muted, so uh, the only people you will hear speak will be Dr. Polly and myself. But you can interact with us by uh, typing into the chat box um, below the participants list. So if you have questions or comments, you can uh, feel free to type those in there. And uh, we will uh, probably hold most of them until the end. But if there's something that we need to stop and address uh, while uh, Dr. Polly is going through his slides, we'll certainly try to do that. Um, you also have um, the ability to interact with us with a couple other options. You might see a little icon of a, of a man sort of raising his hand. In, in that drop-down menu, you can uh, let us know if you, um, if, if you need us to speak louder or softer or slow down, or uh, you can offer applause or laughter or a variety of different things um, right there at that icon. And I think that's all. And I'll just remind you that we are recording the webinar today, and that will get posted on the Great Plains Fire Science YouTube site uh, once we have the editing completed. So that's, that's enough about Great Plains. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dr. Polly before he begins. Um, Dr. Polly is a research ecologist with the USDA ARS, or Agricultural Research Service, and he's in Temple, Texas. He's been there for about 25 years and has focused his studies on the effects of atmospheric carbon dioxide on grasslands and rangelands. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Polly. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, turn off the camera and mute my microphone, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sherry, and thank you to everyone for attending this morning. Let me see if I can navigate these slides. Go to the title slide. Uh, as the title implies, I'm interested in visiting with you today a little bit about the effects of uh, projected climate change on uh, what I call ecosystem processes on rangelands used primarily for livestock grazing. So we'll be looking at uh, climate change effect, effects on plant production, um, plant communities, and discuss some of the implications for fire regimes. Uh, so here's another picture. Uh, some ecologists uh, with the Agricultural Research Service uh, have been looking at climate change type issues for 25 years. Uh, most of what I'll speak about today uh, can be derived from a couple of recent review articles uh, that we published in Rangeland Ecology and Management last year. And so most of what I'll talk about today uh, I can uh, comes from the work of my co-authors on those papers. They include uh, Jack Morgan with ARS, uh, David Brisky and Bruce McCall with Texas A&M University, Klaus Walter with uh, NOAA in Boulder, Colorado, 
Derek Bailey is with uh, New Mexico State University. Joel Brown is with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and Linda Joyce is with Forest Service. Uh, so I, I thank each of those co-authors for their input to the material I will present today. If any of this interests you and you have an interest in following up and perhaps do not have access to those journal articles, if you will shoot me an email at the email address. I think I have a pointer here. Shown right here. After we're done, I'll be happy to email uh, PDFs of these uh, publications to you. So this is a brief outline of what I'd like to discuss with you today. Uh, actually going to go back and spend a little bit of time on basics of what is climate change. When we, when we read about or talk about climate change in today's environment, uh, what is it? Why is it occurring? Uh, just so we're all uh, on the same footing going forward. And then uh, spend some time talking about how climate is projected to change during the next 50 years and most importantly the most of us what are some of the ecological consequences of projected climate change for rangelands so here uh, in the top uh, sentence here again let me get my pointer going uh, this is a, a definition of climate change as we're discussing it today uh, climate change, as you see, is defined as a significant and lasting change in the statistical distribution of meteorological conditions and variations. So that's kind of a uh, stuffy definition, I suppose. But uh, the point of that is that we're discussing more than just weather patterns. Weather patterns change over the course of months or even a few years, but we're talking about climate change in the context that we're discussing that today. We're talking about a directional change in weather variables, uh, including uh, directional changes in temperature, uh, precipitation, and variation in those variables. Climate change we're discussing today is, is human cause in large part, but I'll just point out that uh, climate change, regardless of their origin, result when some factor or factors alters the energy balance of Earth. And of course, there have in the in the past been changes that are result climate changes that have resulted from natural events, including orbital orbital variation of Earth's axis or volcanic eruptions. I just uh, add this example of uh, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1990 to show how natural events like volcanic eruptions can alter, in this case, weather patterns over the course of a year or a couple years. So when Mount Pinatubo erupted, it uh, ejected a lot of ash and other material into the upper atmosphere. That resulted in a cooling of Earth's climate, as you see here, of as much as half a degree C over the course of a year or two. Uh, because the injection of this material uh, blocked incoming solar radiation. Climate change that we read about today, though, or are speaking about is a result largely of human activities. And it's uh, just a recognition that we are in an era now when humans are impacting the fluxes of energy sufficiently on Earth to alter climate. Humans are altering climate uh, largely by contributing to a rapid increase in trace gases in the atmosphere that we refer to collectively as greenhouse gases. And you see at the top of this slide those greenhouse gases are listed. They include carbon dioxide or CO2 as I'll refer to it, methane, nitrous oxide, and tropospheric ozone. These gases uh, contribute to warming, contribute to the greenhouse effect because they partially block the emission of long wave or thermal radiation back into space. So as illustrated diagrammatically here, uh, we are warmed, of course, by the sun. We're cooled in part by the emission of 
thermal radiation back into space, and the greenhouse gases in the upper atmosphere serve to partially block that re-emission of the uh, thermal radiation that has a cooling effect and hence the cause of warming of the climate. Now the greenhouse effect has always been with us and in fact is vital as you probably know to survival on earth because without it uh, for example our day-night temperature swings would be very dramatic as they are on planets that have no atmosphere. So it's not like the greenhouse effect is bad necessarily it's just that uh, further increases in these greenhouse gases are projected to amplify uh, the greenhouse effect that uh, we've experienced over uh, years and decades and centuries and further warm the earth. Warming in turn is projected to increase precipitation or modify precipitation patterns. So this greenhouse effect and this warming associated with the accumulation of greenhouse gases is nothing new, as you probably also know, uh, and is, is depicted in this slide. The slide shows uh, global temperatures over the last 120, 30 years or so. Uh, the bars in this slide uh, for the different years are, are deviations in temperature from the mean global temperature calculated over the period 1900 to 2000. So we see early on in the uh, or the late 1890s, early 1900s, temperatures were below the 100-year average and have risen, particularly in the last 30 years or so, considerably above the average. And this rise in temperatures has occurred as greenhouse gases like CO2 have accumulated in the atmosphere. The CO2 trend is shown here by the black line, having risen from the pre-industrial level around 280 parts per million to actually now we're approaching 400 parts per million. So in total in the last 100 years plus global temperatures increased by about one and a half degrees Fahrenheit and greenhouse gas accumulation is expected to increase temperatures by an additional, additional two degrees centigrade which is four and a half degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century. As I mentioned earlier, in general warming will uh, speed up the water cycle, increase precipitation, although there will be areas that will experience reduced precipitation. And warming is expected to increase the frequency of extreme weather events. So we know uh, several things. We know, for example, that CO2, methane, and these other gases are greenhouse gases. We know that gas concentrations are increasing. And we didn't talk about it, but there's strong evidence that they're increasing because of human activities. And we know that as these gases are greenhouse gases, they contribute uh, to, to warming. There's considerable uncertainty, of course, as to the exact amount of warming and particularly regional uh, distribution of warming and especially the regional distribution of changes in precipitation. And that uncertainty relates, of course, to the complex nature of the climate system. Uh, I'll just use this, this graph to point out a couple of feedbacks that can either amplify or reduce the warming effect of greenhouse gases. Uh, again, Earth is warmed by the radiation that comes um, to the surface from the sun. Some of that radiation is reflected off of clouds and uh, never gets to the Earth, and so cloud cover causes cooling. Greenhouse gases increase uh, water cycle. They could increase cloud cover, increase reflection of solar radiation. That would serve as kind of a negative feedback to dampen the warming effect of greenhouse gases. Some of the solar radiation uh, hits the Earth's surface is reflected off of ice or snow covered areas which uh, serves as a cooling mechanism. If warming were to reduce uh, snow or ice cover, that would tend to amplify the warming effect of greenhouse gases. So this is just, just a, an acknowledgement that the system is complex. And our best estimates going forward of climate change result uh, are come from 
climate models. And uh, what I'm showing here is projected changes in temperature uh, across the I've lost my arrow somewhere, but let's see if I can retrieve it. There it is. Changes in temperature projected by mid-century for uh, across the upper panels here for the western U.S. Lower panels show changes projected for um, precipitation. So we have changes shown here uh, in the annual on the annual cycle annual averages changes projected for winter december january february changes for the summer in january june july and august so in this upper uh, set of panels the uh, darker the color the color of red the greater the warming trend in all cases we're showing warming or warming is projected in this lower set of panels, the yellows, browns, and especially the red show areas that are projected to receive less precipitation in the future. Uh, the blue colored areas are areas projected to see an increase in precipitation. So what we see returning to the temperature area is that uh, Climate models are projecting an average increase in temperature of uh, 2 to 4 degrees centigrade by mid-century, which is 3 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be an increase in temperature of two or more times the increase that we've experienced in the last 100, 120 years or so. You see warming is projected to be greatest in the northern Plains, uh, northern tier of states in the U.S. and southern Canada, especially during winter and during summer in the Great Basin region. And again, the consensus of models is for a drying trend across uh, uh, Texas, the southwest and western tier of states, especially during winter time with a huge decrease in precipitation projected for the northwest during the summer. By contrast, we're expecting an increase in precipitation in northern tier of states in southern Canada, especially during winter. And uh, as I point out again, these are, these are mean trends in warming change in precipitation. Uh, warming is expected to increase weather extremes and particularly within year and between year variation in precipitation. Uh, warming, for example, is expected to increase the frequency of rainfall events, but in decrease the frequency of rainfall events, but increase their size or intensity. And heat waves are expected to continue to increase in frequency and magnitude as warming continues. Let's talk now a little bit about the uh, ecological implications of climate change. First, before diving off into this discussion, I'd like to point out that when we're talking about climate change, we're really talking about what I call three climate change drivers or three components of change. And those involve atmospheric CO2 enrichment, warming, and precipitation modification. Uh, we already mentioned that CO2 is a greenhouse gas that contributes to both warming and change in precipitation. But include CO2 enrichment as a climate change driver, a component of climate change, because CO2 is, a, is an essential resource for plants. So generally, as we increase CO2 in the atmosphere, we increase plant growth. And very importantly for rangelands, CO2 enrichment increases plant growth per unit of water used, or increases what we call plant water use efficiency. And the other, uh, I think, important general comment to make concerning ecological implications of these climate change drivers is that those implications will vary reg regionally. We've already talked about one reason that ecological implications of climate change will vary re regionally, and that is uh, because the expression of drivers will vary regionally. 
Uh, we've already seen that some areas are projected to see an increase in precipitation, uh, whereas others are projected to see a decrease in precipitation. We expect that ecological implications of climate change will vary reg regionally also because interactive effects of these three climate drivers are non-additive. Uh, as an example, I've said that CO2 enrichment can increase plant water use efficiency, and that positive effect of CO2 is often sufficient to offset negative effects of drought, uh, but is uh, not sufficient to offset a severe drought. And so these interaction between CO2 and drought or warming, for example, are non-additive. Ecological implications will vary regionally also because climate differs among regions. So a given degree of warming, for example, may be beneficial in northern areas, but that same warming would be expected to be detrimental in uh, southern areas where it's already hot, for example. And then finally, ecological implications of climate change will vary regionally and even locally because of differences in soils, land use legacies, and the plant species pool among regions and localities. As a first approximation, however, uh, we can say with some confidence that the ecological implications of climate change drivers from rangelands uh, can be estimated by how collectively they impact plant water availability and plant growth per unit of water use. Uh, we know plant production on rangelands typically is water limited and so we'd expect any factor that increases water availability or plant growth per unit of water to have a positive impact on productivity and, and conversely any climate change factor that reduces water availability or water use efficiency to have a negative effect. So I've illustrated the importance of water on rangelands with this slide, uh, which is a plot of above ground debt primary productivity, above ground productivity of plants as a function of precipitation. We see on average, uh, of course, as you know, that greater precipitation tends to increase of productivity. Greater water availability or plant water use tends to increase productivity. So that's the first order prediction and, and will get us a long way, I believe, in understanding uh, climate change impacts on rangelands. System is, of course, uh, infinitely more complicated when we try to, to narrow our projected impacts down to regional and particularly local scales. And that is because the impacts of climate changes on what I'm calling ecosystem processes, things like plant production, uh, livestock production, and the cycling of carbon, nitrogen, water, and other elements that are important to supporting these processes, depend not only on how warm it is or how much precipitation falls, but how those primary climate change drivers interact with disturbance regimes and vegetation composition. So as an example, uh, you know, we know that if it becomes drier as projected for the southern plains, that will have a negative impact on ecosystem processes. But uh, increased droughts could also increase fire frequency or intensity. Uh, you know, with feedbacks on ecosystem processes that may be different from or amplify the primary effects of climate change drivers. So here, here's an example of uh, what could happen if droughts become more frequent. This is actually a, a, a picture of the fire that occurred in an area southeast of Austin in uh, central Texas. This is actually a woodland area. Uh, in the Bastrop area of Texas. This fire occurred during the record 2011 drought in Texas, uh, caused considerable damage, in fact is said to be on an economic basis the most catastrophic fire uh, in Texas recorded history. 
I include this slide just because I think it's a neat slide of the Bastrop fire. So this is a satellite view of the fire, obviously the smoke rising. Uh, this I'm pointing with my pointer and not the pointer that should be. So let me try that again. So this obviously is the fire. This is a satellite view. This is a Gulf of Mexico. This is the Texas coastline. Uh, this would be Houston for perspective. And so this fire had a dramatic effect uh, on the economy. It was one fire among many during this record drought year of 2011 in Texas. Uh, I read that more than 4 million acres in Texas burned during that drought year, which is twice the number of acreages burned during the record of fire year, uh, the previous record fire year. So droughts can have a significant impact on fire frequency and abundance, of course. Droughts uh, can also, via fire, frequency or intensity affect vegetation, which further can feed back on ecosystem processes. Uh, we know, for example, that fires are largest in grass and shrub dominated ecosystems when dry conditions follow unusually wet conditions uh, during which fine fuels have accumulated. This picture is in, intended to illustrate that increasing fire frequency in the Mojave Desert and Great Plains region has converted communities of desert shrublands and shrub step to annual grasslands uh, with the change in ecosystem function and processes. And uh, this shift in vegetation then has a reinforcing effect, of course, in uh, keeping fire frequencies high. So this is an indirect mechanism by which uh, warming, precipitation modification can influence fire frequencies and then uh, vegetation in influence ecosystem processes. Also, I'll point out that uh, uh, droughts or other changes in climate can affect ecosystem processes indirectly by change in vegetation. Uh, droughts, for example, that are accompanied by overgrazing may open the herbaceous canopy reduce fire frequency and create a positive feedback that reinforces woody encroachment, uh, which of course would change livestock production and other processes. Climate change also can lead to, or play a role at least, in promoting what we term no analog or novel plant communities. Uh, these are communities, they're combinations of species that are unlike any found today. Uh, the reason climate change can promote these novel or no analog communities is because climate change is expected to lead to combinations of seasonal temperature or precipitation that differ from current conditions. You combine these novel environmental or climatic conditions with the fact that uh, there are a large number of exotic or non-indigenous species on the landscape and you can see that the chances for novel communities tend to increase in frequency. Uh, as illustrated in this upper left-hand panel of this slide, uh, novel communities of species having, of species that originate in different parts of the world are already common in the central plains region of this country as a result of human transformations Climate change is anticipated to uh, lead to conditions that increase this shift to no analog or novel communities, which I point out are frequently less diverse, contain fewer species than the novel species that they replace. So in the last few minutes, I want to talk uh, specifically about the Great Plains and specifically about how climate projections may impact ecosystem processes in the southern Great Plains region. Uh, I've lost my arrow again. But you know where the southern plains are and the no northern plains. Uh, so as illustrated in this graphic, uh, which again is a climate projection for mid-century, 
The southern plains are expected to become considerably warmer and also drier with greatest drying in the southern portion of the region. Uh, warmer and drier conditions of course would be expected to reduce soil water availability. That would reduce plant production as we've already spoken, likely reduce forage quality. And also point out that the increase in CO2 concentration itself, uh, another of the climate change drivers, is likely to reduce forage quality. Uh, I, I read that uh, uh, maintenance requirements for mature cattle is about 7% crude protein content, which is 1 to 1.1% 1 .1 nitrogen in the forage, with critical levels of 5% crude protein content or 0.8% nitrogen content in the forage. Uh, maintenance and critical levels of crude protein and nitrogen are considerably higher for young growing cattle or for lactating cattle, but I want you just to focus on this critical level. As I show you how uh, CO2 enrichment could reduce forage quality below that, forage, that uh, critical level. It does so by increasing plant growth more than nitrogen uptake. So this is at 0.8% nitrogen critical level, uh, maintenance level for mature cattle. And these are data on nitrogen content of warm season grasses growing in the field when exposed to CO2 concentration gradient that span pre-industrial through current to projected mid-century levels. So uh, the point of this is that CO2 enrichment can actually have a negative effect on forage quality and with combined with the negative effects of forage quality and quality of increasing drought and uh, de uh, warmer temperatures and drying which is expected to increase drought uh, could severely limit livestock production in the southern plains. And added to those stresses of course Livestock production will be exposed to the heat stress in an area that is already very hot. Droughts and heat stress might reduce water availability, uh, which also has a negative impact. So in, in summary then, the projections don't look very promising for livestock production in the southern plains. Point out that drought can also have lasting effects what we might call legacy effects uh, that are further negative impact on livestock production. Uh, these legacy effects could result if forage plants are lost during drought and replaced by woody or weedy species. Uh, I was reading recently that it's been three years since the historic 2011 drought in, in the southern plains and yet cattle herds are still 40 percent lower on average in Texas Oklahoma and New Mexico than prior to the drought. There are of course several reasons that might be the case, but one possibly is that uh, forage plants, uh, the forage base has been slow to recover from drought. So things don't look too good going forward if the climate projections are, are accurate, at least for the southern plains. But the story may be very different in the northern plains. Uh, the mid Century projections call for warming in the northern plains, but also an increase in precipitation. Uh, so this is a warming, increasing precipitation on average, but particularly during the winter months. Coupled with higher CO2 concentrations, which generally increase plant growth, warming and precipitation increase, particularly during winter, would be anticipated to increase plant productivity by alleviating growth, growth limitations early in the season. Uh, forage quality is expected to increase or remain constant uh, with this combination of climate change drivers. And these trends in, in some would be expected to increase live production, livestock production. Combined with the climate trends that are expected in the southern plains, uh, we might anticipate an increase or a northern uh, migration of the loci of rangeland cattle production 
over the next several decades. Uh, so uh, thank you again for your your interest and your participation this morning. I end with this uh, slide trying to summarize some of the main comments that I've tried to cover. Uh, we recognize that there are three climate change drivers of interest, rising CO2, warming, and precipitation modification. Uh, tried to point out that at first order of prediction, first level prediction at least, uh, we can be confident that the impacts collectively of these drivers can be predicted by the, how they affect soil water availability because of the importance obviously of water availability and plant water use in, in controlling plant productivity and other functions on rangelands. As I've also pointed out that uh, for various reasons the predictions of ecological impacts become much more complicated as we kind of focus in our scale geographically as we, we look at regional and local scales. And part of the reason we expect ecological impacts to vary, uh, as I've tried to point out, is regionally at least, is because of the regional variation in the projected impacts with strongest negative impacts in the southern plains, potentially positive impacts on plant productivity and the livestock industry in the northern plains. And then finally, uh, as pointed out, climate change means more than a change in simply the average conditions. Uh, climate change is projected to increase the occurrence of climatic extremes which could have a number of impacts, one of which is to increase the frequency of extent of wildfires in rangelands and shrublands. And, and with that in mind, uh, perhaps we need to be thinking about how we might wish to adjust the timing or frequency of controlled burns uh, to better manage vegetation in the future. Again, uh, thank you very much for your, your time and attention, and if you'd like copies of either of the review articles that were published in Rangeland Ecology and Management, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send those along to you. So I'll turn the floor back over to Sherry. Thank you very much, Dr. Polly. And I'd like to invite any of you, if you would like uh, to ask Dr. Polly a question or um, have a comment on what he's just covered, please feel free to write that in the chat box. And we'll just wait a couple minutes while you're thinking about that. Um, while folks are writing their questions, I just want to remind you, uh, if you're interested in the continuing education credits, to send me an email at gpfirescience uh, at missouristate.edu. So gpfirescience.edu. Looks like a couple of people are getting some questions ready. So Dr. Polly, the first one, um, I think you can probably see it there. Do cool season grasses have the same nitrogen response? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, CO2 enrichment, at least, uh, tends to reduce the nitrogen concentration in cool season grasses. And actually, the absolute reduction, as I recall, is greater in C3s or cool season grasses than in the warm season grasses. Uh, because nitrogen levels typically are higher in the cool season and warm season grasses. So in terms of CO2 enrichment, yes, uh, the decline in forage quality will be manifest in cool season as well as warm season grasses. I see a second question here. Do you predict detrimental impacts to warm season grasses in the northern plains? Um, I think in general, if, if climate projections are correct and climate projections are that precipitation will increase in the northern plains and temperatures will increase, uh, I would expect those to generally favor uh, warm season grasses. I think the precipitation occurs mostly in the, the uh, cool, in the warm, cooler part of the year, the winter cool season would be benefited. But, uh, in general, 
more precipitation plus slightly warmer temperatures would benefit warm season grasses, I would predict. Although we might see some of the negative impacts of CO2 enrichment on forage quality uh, manifest there as well. So I hope that answers your question. I see a third question here. Uh, would adaptation for livestock producers in the southern plains include a shift in breeds of cattle or types of livestock? Uh, the short answer is, is yes, and I believe that's already occurring. Uh, so again, just as a reminder, the southern plains, the projections are that southern plains will become warmer and drier. Uh, you know, as I pointed out in one of the early slides, already within the last century and certainly within the last uh, several decades we've seen a warming trend and that that warming trend probably is already being manifest among livestock producers in a shift in cattle from the uh, European breeds to the more heat tolerant um, Indian breeds particularly in South Texas we've seen that shift occur it's the type of livestock, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on the, at the, at the larger scale, but certainly locally, and for a number of reasons, uh, I think there's been a shift to more goats in the central Texas, at least, area uh, in lieu of livestock production. I think that probably reflects a number of things, including climate warming, uh, one being smaller land holdings, uh, I guess recreational ranchers uh, rather than full-time ranchers, so those are part of the issue. But uh, that, that's a very good question, and I do expect, and I think we're already expecting changes in livestock breeds uh, and even the type of grazing animals that are used on rangelands. Another so the, question? The next... Go ahead, Sherry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to read it for you. Uh, do you foresee a major land use change toward away from rangeland? I, I think uh, particularly in the southern areas of the, of the country, if they're already warm and in many cases already dry. They become warmer and drier. It will be increasingly difficult to maintain a livelihood as a livestock producer. You know, those of you, probably most of you are either livestock producers or are well aware of the economic issues that uh, agricultural industry in general faces. And it's a narrow margin as it is and anything that will make that Uh, just kind of on an anecdotal note, I, I know of a few ranchers locally who have given up since the 2011 drought. And they just said, you know, we had to destock. It's too expensive to restock, given the uncertainties in climate and livestock uh, markets, and so they're they're out of the game. And and either either they're renting their land for livestock production, or they're using it for recreational purposes. So. Um, so yes, I, I, I do see a shift, particularly in these areas that are already hard pressed to maintain livestock industry away from livestock production. I was wondering if you might talk for a second about um, maybe proactive um, approaches rather than you know, when it comes to climate change nationally at least. Uh, policies than very reactive if, if it does indeed exist. Are there, are there sort of proactive things that people should be doing with respect to range lands to anticipate the changes in uh, climate change? Well, there, there are, uh, and again, I refer to you one of those review articles. The one uh, co uh, lead author was Linda Joyce. Uh, that article deals specifically with adaptation measures that can be taken. Uh, you know, I think as, as a first 
option is a, is a, a first response. We can take what we call no regrets kind of measures. And uh, these are things that if we're not doing so already, we probably should be doing so. Things like preparing for drought, which uh, with or without climate change is an inevitable on rangelands. So you know, preparing for drought and thinking about uh, uh, in the case of drought, am I overstocked? Uh, what do I do if I have too many animals? Do I have a grass bank somewhere? Do I have an alternate forage base? Uh, that sort of thing would be important whether or not we see really dramatic changes of climate. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of that uh, in general, policy-wise or perhaps on the ground, or just preparing for inevitable um, bad years that roll around, uh, seems like more often than not, on rangelands. And it's because, as, as you point out, Sherry, I think our policy particularly at the, the higher levels, is reactive rather than proactive. And we tend to reward uh, people for not being prepared with uh, drought relief payments, for example. So I think kind of reversing that, become more proactive, thinking of what we might do when things in the year turns against us and how we might be prepared to weather that, whether it means including alternate uh, income streams or deciding how we, we deal with our, our, um, our herds during drought. So I hope, hope that partially answered your question. Yeah, and that, it looks like we have uh, one more that's been typed in, looking at the distribution of northern Great Plains precipitation to winter. It looks like he's saying an increase may favor C3 Let's see, C3, increased temperature favors C4, and that may be only minor change in aggregate composition. I'm not I, sure I think you're, right. yeah, I, well, I, I think I understand and I, I agree. Um, I, I talked some about changes in the composition of the, the rangeland, the multi-species communities, and in, in general, warmer temperatures tend to favor C4s. Uh, and increased precipitation during the winter as projected for the northern <clears throat> northern Great Plains would favor C3. Uh, I think this questioner is 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 posing the uh, idea that the net effect of climate change drivers on C3 C4 composition in the northern Great Plains will be minor and I I would tend to agree with uh, that assessment. There's a question about what effects will change have on wildlife. Uh, that's a really good question. Obviously, I'm not a wildlife biologist, and um, you know, so it's difficult for me to answer that question. Uh, I guess in, in thinking about how to answer that question, I would think about um, how these climate change driver effects on forage quality might impact wildlife, uh, if, if that would be an important impact, positive or negative, on wildlife. And uh, secondly, uh, how increasing drought frequency could affect wildlife, uh, particularly in areas in the south, southwest, or projected to become drier. I would expect the conditions are not going to be very, very favorable for wildlife. At least it depends on grass and, and grasslands, uh, perhaps better in the north. That's a really poor question, answer to your question, I know, but uh, hopefully uh, that's something. Thanks. It looks like we've tapped everyone out on their uh, questions today. So I appreciate you uh, being with us, Dr. Polly, and uh, we have recorded the webinar and we'll get that posted as soon as we have a chance. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Polly had his email address up at the beginning so you can contact him with questions. Oh, we got one more 
are you, would you like to address that last question? Sure. Uh, question is, so you see a change or shift in livestock location due to climate change extremes. Uh, for example, what might happen in moving your lease grazelands north to accommodate the drought, the limitations in water availability. Uh, I think that uh, one interpretation of my interpretation or answer to the, the question, uh, well, let me rephrase the question, uh, would be it can changing, varying north-south the location of livestock production uh, help accommodate or offset these negative effects of climate change? And I think certainly the answer is yes. Uh, given the projections for deteriorating conditions in the south, improving conditions uh, from a livestock pr perspective in the north, I think in general livestock production on rangelands will move northward. If I'm interpreting the question correctly, uh, you know, if you have that flexibility to shift uh, some of your lease lands or herds northward or, or do so on a seasonal basis, I think that would be one way to uh, adapt to coming climate change. Okay. I see one more person is typing, so we might just give him a second, um, and then uh, we will end the webinar after that. It'll allow everyone to go and, and get their lunches. There we go. Oh, well, it's it's a a comment. Uh, I think reinforcing the the, uh, the the previous question or the previous statement that indeed people do move livestock around um, around the country even uh, to take advantage of favorable seasonal conditions. The downside of that, of course, is that it costs money to ship those cows and, and so forth. And if you think from a carbon footprint perspective, you know, it really takes a lot of carbon. That the carbon input per unit of carbon or livestock product produced becomes quite high when you have to factor in moving cattle long distances. Maybe it's time for return of the cattle drives. When you mm -hmm. think about maybe that would be the way to go. Yeah, as you were saying that, I was just thinking of the, the cattle drives that brought the cattle up from Texas all the way to Kansas on a regular basis for, for a while. I was just going to make one last comment based on the uh, statement that has been written here. Um, person pointing out that they're seeing more shifting of cattle, and the, and the previous two comments have, have been uh, similar in nature. I think that is just evidence to the fact that livestock producers and agricultural producers in general um, evidence that they are adapting to changing conditions, whether they be climatic or economic or otherwise, that uh, people will adapt. Climate change will occur slowly enough that uh, people will begin to adapt. Uh, that does not, in my estimation, uh, reduce the importance of planning ahead, but we, we definitely are seeing that people are adapting, have adapted already. and. Uh, so producers are, are knowledgeable and they're resilient, and I have no doubt that they will find ways to be successful. Great. Thanks Thank again. You You're welcome, and thanks for a great webinar. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and, and wrap it up.